Hey everyone, uh, we're looking to hire a part-time communications manager to join the Epicenter team. You can get more information about that position at epicenter.tv slash apply. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you have, think you have what it takes, go to that website uh, and uh, you'll find the job description and uh, the instructions on how to apply for our communications manager position. Thanks. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is a user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today's episode will focus on Corda, which is a platform built by R3. We have as our guests Richard Brown, who is the CTO at R3, and Mike Hearn, who is the lead platform engineer. Uh, very happy to welcome you, both of you gentlemen, on the show. So let's start with Richard. Perhaps a bit about your background would be nice, Richard. How did you get involved in the blockchain space? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, so I, I joined R3 in September last year, so I guess 13 months ago now. And I joined after um, an, my entire career, having been at IBM in various roles in, um, in, um, in IBM's UK offices. So I joined IBM straight out of university as a, as a software engineer. And I worked in, in various engineering and some pre-sales roles, um, almost exclusively in finance, uh, both in London, Europe, and across the world. Um, and I think I got into this space. I need to go back and check the exact time, the exact date. But it was a, um, it was actually through the Economist. There was a, a one, sort of one column inch article, just almost a throwaway little article in the Economist about this strange thing called called Bitcoin. It must have been in 2012, maybe 2013, and that's what piqued my interest. Um, and I guess I won't rehearse the um, the story that's followed um, from then till now. Um, but um, but I, I guess I got completely sucked into the um, into the rabbit hole. Spent a lot of time um, getting my getting my head around it, um, being fascinated by it. And then to be honest, putting it on the shelf for quite some time until the real hype kicked off a year or so later. And it just struck me that almost everybody who was purporting to be an expert about it or comment about it, um, they just completely missed the point. They either were making overinflated claim, claims for how it was going to completely transform finance without understanding finance, or they were making ridiculous claims for how Bitcoin was the most evil thing in the world without really understanding Bitcoin. So that's what motivated me to, to start a blog where I spent a lot of time explaining Bitcoin and blockchain concepts to, to bankers and a lot of time explaining financial concepts to, to the, the Bitcoin and blockchain community. Um, and, and from there, I got more and more, more involved, did more and more work on it at IBM. Um, and eventually, when it became clear to me that the way forward was um, deploying this technology at scale through collaborative efforts and through consortia when it comes to finance, um, when, uh, when I realized the R3 initiative um, was, was trying to do just that, it was the obvious thing for me to do, um, for me to join in. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Richard's blog is at agendal.me, and it's a, an excellent blog. I think you were one of the, certainly one of the best writers on, on this technology, also together with another guy who's at R3 now, Tim Swanson. And we were in contact with you a long time ago, actually, and, and kept asking you when you were still at IBM, like, oh, we, you need to come on the podcast, we need to do an episode, and you, you kept saying, like, I'd love to, I'm not, um, I, they, don't, they don't let me uh, ask me again in a month. So we did that for like, I don't know, a year, <laughs> or maybe not a year, but a long time. And then you joined R3 and of course, uh, ask again, like, are you ready now? And I'm uh, still not allowed to. So we're glad that finally you're allowed to. No, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And yeah, I used to get, I remember the emails I used to get from you and I used to dread them because I could never say yes. But the main reason I, I didn't say yes was um, you know, when, you, when you come on things like that, you, you want to have something to talk about, you, you, you can, you can you, you can commentate or you can um, you can give um, uh, sort of broad views, but I think these 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 podcasts are, are really valuable and fascinating when 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 we're talking about you know, a real thing with the people who are building it. So, so I'm delighted to be waited until now. 
Yeah. And of course, Mike, who's been on this podcast twice before, I think. Uh, and both times they got a lot of attention. I, I remember the first time you were on, you made a statement that, you know, Bitcoin development has ground to a halt, which then got a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. And, and then I think actually the last time you were on, that was shortly before that was sort of with the Bitcoin XT, uh, controversy when you guys were trying to, you know, get bigger blocks and get to switch away from, uh, from Bitcoin core. And then shortly afterwards, uh, you left. So how is how is life uh, post Bitcoin? Good. It's more productive. Yeah. You don't miss the arguments. The no. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, right? That's the question. I don't think so. But yeah, that was about a year ago, wasn't it? I think the last time I was on the show. Yeah, around October, November time. And I guess now, from sort of your outsider's perspective, I mean, at the time, a lot of people disagreed with you. Today, I think a lot of people have sort of, well, opinions, of course, still diverge, but I would think that uh, your position back then has become more of like, well, yeah, you were kind of right and in, in that a lot of changes didn't happen. Are you still following what's going on and, and how do you look at it now with some distance? Um, yeah, I sort of keep half an eye on what's going on in, in the Bitcoin community. I don't, you know, I don't post or comment anymore or anything like that, but I think, yeah, the way events have worked out, pretty much everything that I, I predicted in those in the articles I was writing last year have, have come true. You know, we've, there's been media that said, oh, that there was a show on NPR radio in the States where it, the show was about Bitcoin and it started by the two journalists saying, I tried to send money to the other guy and it didn't work. And that was one of the things I predicted would happen. So, you know, the, the bad media um, coverage of the problems. So, yeah, I, I keep half an eye on it. Nothing really seems to have changed. So I haven't been paying too much attention, but um, oh, it's, it's a shame. Things things don't seem to have changed much in one year. Yeah, and I think the the worst thing is, even though I'm sure people still work on a lot of interesting technology, even the guys on Blockstream, right, doing a lot of interesting things with segregated witness and stuff, but there's just the, the community and the way of making decisions has become so divided that it's uh, it, the project certainly hasn't developed very well. But uh, enough of that. So that's not why we're here. Um, so R3, a lot of people, of course, know about R3. At the same time, it's this kind of mysterious and strange <laughs> entity, right? It, it's sort of a startup, but then it like f is set up in a completely unorthodox way. So can you share, can you guys share a bit about uh, what's the origin story of R3 and, and what does that organization look like? Yeah, sure. Why, why, why don't I take that? So, um, yeah, it, it's strange how we, we, we're we seen as this this mysterious thing. It, we certainly don't feel mysterious to ourselves and we, we do try to be open, but um, um, but maybe we can go some way towards um, addressing that here. So, so R3 was founded um, some time ago. We, we came to, to public prominence in September last year, September 2015, when we announced the founding of a, of a consortium of, of large financial institutions. Um, I think there were nine at the time. Um, it grew to 42 by the end of, I think, last November, and we now have over, over 70 members. But, uh, but R3's history actually goes back, I think, a year or so um, before that. Um, and th there's, I guess there's, there's quite, quite, a lot of, um, quite a lot of interesting history, but perhaps one or two of the things that, um, that are most pertinent are that it was, it was founded by our CEO, um, David Rutter, who'd spent um, a career you know, over three decades on, on Wall Street. Um, and and um, although this wasn't his his prime his prime um, focus over those years, his career was was punctuated by success in building a series of very large scale, very successful industry consortia. Um, he seems to be the you know the person in the world who's able to to help bring together otherwise you know, sort of competing um, institutions, bring them together um, when 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 something collaborative needs to be built. Um, for those who know the financial markets, he was um, chief executive of, of EBS and of BrokerTech, of, 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 of large um, collaborative efforts. Um, and all the way through 2015, and uh, as far as back in 2014, um, after leaving, um, his, after leaving his, his previous role, a senior role um, at Wall Street, he, um, he, um, he took a trip out to the, to the West Coast um, to, to understand more about what was going on. And he got very close to what was happening in Bitcoin. 
um, who's, who's amongst the first to talk in public about how the, the underlying technology, you know, what we now call blockchain or distributed ledger technology, um, had applicability beyond the, the Bitcoin use case. Um, and, and he realized that if, 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 at least his belief was, if, 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 if things were going to happen in, in mainstream finance, in, in financial markets and beyond, then um, this is inherently shared technology, it's inherently distributed technology. Um, it, requires, it requires organizations to come together to understand it, to evaluate it, to, to figure out what needs to be done, figure out what needs to be built, and to do it collaboratively through a consortium. So he, he drove, that was the insight driving the formation of, of the R3 um, consortium. So fast forward to September, that got off the ground, I joined, we rapidly got to 42 banks, now, now, now north of 70. Um, and we began our work in earnest um, 13 months ago. So the consortium is one thing, and the consortium if, uh, is, is sort of like a, a place for experimentation, you know, where you get like those banks together and they kind of run these, uh, these little projects. And, uh, and, but then the separate, what you guys have been working on is almost like a separate project within R3, right? Um, kind of. So the, the thing we, we began with, and, and we, were, we were open about this at the time, was that there were always um, three primary strands to the, to the work we were doing with our members and, and with the community more broadly. There was um, architecture, and, and doing that through what we call the architecture working group, and that, that's what I chair, and, and I'll come on to that in a moment. There was always and continues to be a, a very um, laser-like focus on what we called use cases, but I guess what most people would think of as, as products. So you know, to what uses can this technology be put that's valuable for, that's valuable for members and, and, and for society? And then, as you mentioned, there is also our, um, our global collaborative lab, what's now our lab and research center, um, which is a powerhouse for running, um, running um, projects. And those projects might be evaluations of, of specific technology. Now, the insight there is um, if, um, if multiple institutions are interested in evaluating the same technology, rather than each one running it to slightly different standards, slightly different um, evaluation criteria, let's come together and run it once and, 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 and share and publish the results working in concert with the, with the provider. And we, um, we, um, I think we were public much earlier this year with some of the, um, some of the experiments we've done. But it's also where, also where members and others can come together to, to work together jointly on projects looking at specific, specific product or, 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 um, or, or commercial ideas. So that's a real powerhouse for collaboration amongst the, 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 the member financial institutions and, um, and beyond. Um, but, but your question about um, technology, um, we, we began as, as, as one of the three strands um, was and remains our, our architecture working group. And my, um, and, and my, my mission, and I actually wrote this in, in, in the blog post that I, that I put out um, earlier this month, um, the mission given to me was, um, was set as the very first decision of our steering committee. That's the thing that the, um, you know, the, the, the senior, senior executives from all our members sit on. The very first decision they made was to formalize the creation of the architecture working group and give us the mission to establish the architecture for an open enterprise grade scale um, ledger for the processing of financial events and, and automation of business logic. Um, and so that, that was our mission to, um, to, to answer that problem, answer that statement. And I guess we'll go through that in more detail. But, um, but the, the vision right from the start was to do um, solid requirements-based engineering to understand what this technology's relevance might be. Not all the things this technology can do is relevant to finance. Understand what its relevance might be. Understand what needs to be done to make it deployable at scale, securely, reliably, and usefully in, in finance, and then go do it. So in, in, in pursuit of this aim, um, like at the start of the year, uh, there were many news stories that the consortium had taken some technology, let's say Aris, the Aris technology stack, and they had created, uh, I guess, like small experiments where commercial paper trading was being done using the Aris technology stack. But all the uh, partners of the R3 consortium were kind of involved in that experiment. And the initial impression that outsiders like me got was um, that R3 is going to just uh, not build any technology of its own, but it's going to act as a filter for all of these projects, like check all of them out see what ideas are good and then deploy them at scale in the consortium. That's what my initial thought process was. But then I think in the middle of the year, you came out strongly in, with, uh, with Corda and indicated that there would be an independent platform. And now like you've announced that Corda is going to be open sourced on November 30th. 
so uh so the question is like why did you go down this direction of building something uh bespoke or new other than just leveraging technologies that other people are building sure okay so i'll, I'll start with that and that might also be a good segue in, in, into some, some observations from mike as well so the first thing i should say is um throughout this process um and even with the open sourcing of corda um, we don't claim that Corda is the answer to all the world's problems. Just as I've been very, very vocal um, in, in public and, and on my blog and, and so forth, uh, saying that you know Bitcoin doesn't solve everything. Bitcoin is good for the problem it solves. Similarly with Eris and these uh, and Ethereum and all these other platforms, um, we don't we don't we don't claim that, that Corda solves all these problems. Um, but what we do claim is it solves a specific set of problems that are pertinent to the financial industry in particular, although not or not exclusive to the financial industry. Uh, and we think it fills a gap that, that other platforms don't fill. But, but how did we get to the point where we even decided we needed to build something like Corda? And, and for that, it goes back to the mission statement of the, the architecture working group. And, and excuse me, the, the work we did, um, the work we kicked off um, at the end of last year once we were up and running. And the, the, the two questions that I, I drove through the architecture working group, because I, I was petrified, if, if you like, you know, almost paranoid, that simply trying to apply you know, blockchain to business or applying distributed ledgers to finance without a good, solid set of requirements and a good description of what problem we're trying to solve it was not good engineering. It was, it, was, it was not an appropriate way forward. We needed something more solid than that. So as I say, we, we, we kicked off um, two, two parallel pieces of work. One was to, to look at the existing platforms and answer the question, because you know, it may seem obvious to those of us who are steeped in this space, but to answer the question, is there anything genuinely new in the, in, in the blockchain and, and, and the, the broader distributed ledger space? Um, you know, it's not often that the breakthroughs in computer science um, come through. So let's be clear, is there anything genuinely new here beyond, say, the, you know, the advent of, of, of the cryptocurrency revolution with, with Bitcoin and the like? So number one, what if anything is new? And then question number two, you know, to the extent there is something new, what, if anything, is the, is the applicability to finance? You know, it, it does not follow, or rather it is not obvious that the technology that was originally designed, um, some would argue, to, to disintermediate financial institutions. It doesn't follow or it's not obvious that that technology is, is going to be one of the most important technologies for them. You have to make a compelling argument for why that's the case. So, um, so without going into all the detail, we, we can elaborate later. Um, taking those two, two questions in turn. You know, what, if anything, is, is new about this space? Well, the conclusion we reached, and again, it's obvious to those of us who are steeped in this space, is that, yes, there is something new. This is all about building systems that are de deployed across and between large numbers of, of entities who don't necessarily know each other, who don't fully trust each other, and yet which can bring all those entities, can bring all those parties into consensus about the existence, the nature, you know, the evolution of some set of shared facts, some set of shared facts that exist between them. Now that seems quite a quite an abstract definition, and maybe it's not perfectly right. But it's, but, it's, but for our purposes, it's close enough. You know, it it um it captures Bitcoin. Bitcoin brings on trusting people into consensus about how many Bitcoins there are right now, which addresses own them, who's allowed to spend them. Um, Ethereum, we bring people who don't fully trust each other into consensus about you know, the, the state of the of the, of the Ethereum and the global Ethereum virtual machine. Um, and and we didn't really have that before. You know, we had. We had distributed databases, but they're typically run by one organization. We have systems that are deployed by a centralized institution that everybody else agrees to trust. But, 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 but data that is managed somewhat cooperatively across a large number of, of, of mutually distrusting organizations and, and that works reliably, yeah, that's, that's kind of new. That's really quite interesting. So if you then turn attention to finance, you say, well, where in finance do we have examples of, 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 of entities who may want to interact with each other, might want to transact with each other, but don't fully trust each other. You know, they wouldn't trust the other side to manage all their accounts for them. But where there's a need to ensure that all relevant people are in consensus about the existence, the nature, and, and the evolution of some shared fact. Well, you could argue perhaps with only a little exaggeration, but that pretty much defines the financial system, certainly the back offices of the financial system, where you've got people who are trading with each other, but each who need to keep track of their own records, they need to keep track of all the details. They need to build and maintain and manage systems that, that, that track those agreements and those, those trades throughout their life cycle. And they have to agree at every step. If they calculate different values for who owes what to whom, then we've got a, got a break. We need to go through an expensive um, fixing process or a process to fix it. 
and there's a huge amount of reconciliation of paperwork and communication we, we need to go through to bring all these disparate systems that should all be doing the same thing to make sure they actually are all doing the same thing. So, so that's kind of like the, um, that, that's the journey you go on. You know, what, if, what if anything is, is new in this space, bringing interesting parties into consensus? What might the application be in finance? You know, anywhere where the same information is recorded in multiple places, which is pretty much everywhere. But then after a long meandering talk, for which I apologize, answering your question, why did we get onto the path of thinking we needed to build Corda? Well, you then look at the technology that, that's available. And of course, it, 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 it's also obvious to state that the technology that inspired this movement, the technologies that, um, that, 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 that take people like us on this, on this, um, on this thought process, you know, they, they weren't designed to solve problems like reconciliation in back offices in, in investment banks. Um, and that's no criticism of those technologies. You know, Bitcoin is a very elegant, successful solution for the problem it solves, as is Ethereum. But neither of them were designed to solve the problems that just outlined. So, um, and, and this is perhaps the last point on this. So, so, we, um, so we, we reached a point where we, where we needed to, we had, there's a fork in the road. We could either spend a lot of time um, trying to uh, amend, edit, and um, influence the, the existing platforms to move in a direction where they, they could um, adequately solve those problems, um, or we should build something ourselves. And the, and the conclusion we reached was, it simply wouldn't be credible to go out into the market, and remember this is the back end of 2015, to go out into the market and simply tell everybody, um, you know, simply assert that the, the, the technology isn't quite right or doesn't do what we want. You know, it's very easy to criticize, it's very easy to poke holes. It's altogether harder to, um, to, to show a workable alternative. So we thought it was incumbent on ourselves to show that yes, these ideas we have for other ways of building these systems based on blockchain principles, um, to show that those, those approaches actually could work, that actually um, could, um, could address some of the problems around scalability and privacy and expressiveness and so forth that, um, that, we, that we saw in other platforms. Um, you know, that was a key reason for, for bringing Mike Hearn in, and, and he'll, he'll talk more in a moment. Um, but that, that was the genesis of Corda. And as we did more prototyping, as, as it evolved, as, it, as, we, as we followed the, almost the inexorable logic of the, um, the inexorable logic of the requirements and the analysis, um, you know, Corda developed, it, 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 uh, it matured. We did not allow ourselves to be, to be constrained by what other people had done in the past. Um, and you know, in, in short order, we ended up with a design that is, is, is heavily influenced by, but is fundamentally different to the other platforms out there. And hence why we think it's worth, uh, why we thought it was, con it was worth continuing to invest in and why we now want to share it with the world. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J A XX.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. So moving on a little bit to the more, the more technical side of Corda, what are the, the kind of high level decisions that you had to make in order to come up with an architecture and those decisions? There's going to be a technical white paper, um, which I'm writing at the moment actually, which will go into all of this in like a lot of detail. Um, it will, it, it's not quite a specification in the same way that the Ethereum yellow paper is, but it, it covers all, all of the design points, a lot of detail. Um, so there were a bunch of things. One is, um, we felt pretty strongly up front that, you know, there's two models of computation, right? In, in this space There's the Bitcoin model of, uh, transactions with these inputs and outputs, and you have the unspent transaction output sets, and that's the database, the UTXO model. They call it in, in the finance space. And then you've got the Ethereum model, which is sort of a distributed computer. And we, we chose up front to go with the Bitcoin model for a bunch of reasons. And Richard can talk a little bit about why, but um, it had a whole bunch of advantages. It, 
but at the same time, um, a lot of uh, you know financial developers actually liked the uh, Ethereum developer experience. It's a much more developer friendly project. Um, you can use you don't have to write code in assembly, for example. Um, you know, you, you, it's a bit, a bit easier to think about. And so a lot of the um, design decisions that we've been making are about how do we take this um, model that Bitcoin uses, which has all kinds of advantages around privacy and scalability and all kinds of other nice features that we want, um, and yet make it easy to use for developers who don't really want to think about the details. Uh, that a lot of the, oh, and the other one was, um, the other design decision that was key, and then these two had been made when I joined R3 already, limited data distribution. So data goes only where it needs to go. Uh, if there's no global broadcast in quarter anywhere. And these two design decisions, as we explored them, they led on to a whole bunch of other design decisions and they led on to even more design decisions. And this is probably the most design heavy project I've ever worked on, actually. Almost all, Satoshi once said about building Bitcoin that actually, you know, he spent over two years on it and, and almost all of the work was design. It wasn't actually coding. It was mostly design work. And this is a, very similar. Yeah, and I guess the advantage you guys had here was that Satoshi did this in isolation or maybe with some collaborators, whereas you had the, the big advantage of having a significant organization with resources and with people to speak with, as opposed to building something that's like totally novel and you can't really test so well whether the design works or not. Yeah, well... You know, I was, I, was, I was sort of the first full-time developer hired. So one of the tasks that we've, we've done this year in the past 12, 13 months is build a developer team from scratch by hiring, right? Um, primarily, in, well, actually almost entirely in London, except for me. And yeah, often, you know, what a lot of the process of, of design in Corda has been, we will come up with a design we think works based on our own knowledge of finance. And we have in-house experts and we have team members. The team is a mix of people with computer science and uh cryptocurrency type backgrounds and also people with backgrounds in banking and finance they sit next to each other it's a unified team and and you know we would run ideas past them and then also go to the members who all contribute um developers and architects as well and we would write design documents and say hey guys is this sensible does this meet your needs is this stupid what do you think and um that feedback process and they've been contributing in other ways too but the feedback in the discussion process with the members has been really invaluable for yeah just doing some reality checks and making sure that we're not going going off course that said you know bitcoin's design has a lot of really really well thought out stuff in it in many ways it's still um you know it stood the test of time well and, and in many ways it's still a pretty elegant design especially the original one um if you go back to 2009 when it was first released bitcoin's design has actually got worse over time in my view as people have tweaked it but the original design was actually pretty good and we've incorporated a lot of ideas from that except for the blockchain you can argue that that's the most important idea but actually i don't see it that way we don't see it that way there's a lot of ideas in bitcoin that is not mining and blockchain related and we've incorporated a lot of them into quarter so when, when Richard was speaking, uh, like, uh, we came across this idea that uh, the fundamental innovation in, let's say, the blockchain space, for lack of a better word, is the ability to have lots of diverse participants agree on a shared set of facts, right? And, um, and we're trying to apply this to the context of uh, financial services, investment banks or banks, right? And Corda is a platform built to enable that. So with, with that in view, what are the big design decisions did, that you took? And uh, what are the, let's say, the computer science components that you're using? What kind of contracts? What kind of virtual machine technology? What kind of consensus, etc.? So should, I, should, should I just give a little bit on, on that agreement concept just to get that clear and then let Mike um, answer the, um, the, the computer science question? Because um, Meha, you, 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 you correctly identified something and, and I, um, I, I guess in my, my intro, I, I hand waved over it. I said the, you know, the, the, the shared facts in, in finance are, are, are agreements. Um, and I use the word agreements because contracts make people think of smart contracts and and people have already got mental images and mental models for what they are, which may not necessarily map to, to what we're doing. But when I say agreements, I, I mean contracts. And the reason I say that is, you know, if you look at anything, um, any relationship between you know, a customer and a bank or a bank and another bank, um, at its heart, it is a contract. We don't always think about it this way, but the reality is it is. 
So in the, you know, in, the, in the most obvious cases, you know, a very common financial instrument is the interest rate swap, a, a very standard derivative contract. And it's a contract between two identifiable parties. We know who they are, and we have to know who they are because under different circumstances, one will owe money to the other or the other will owe money to the first, and they need to be able to enforce those claims. But it's a contract. We know who the parties are to it. We know its life cycle. We know the events that can happen on it. And we know the rules that apply under different circumstances. So that's quite clear. But the, the observation, maybe the insight we made was um, other things that don't look like contracts are also. So when you put money into a bank, you deposit money with a bank. You're not really depositing money with a bank. You're lending it to the bank. You now have a claim on that bank. Um, there's no vault in sitting in, there's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no sort of vault in the basement with your name on it. So actually the act of depositing money with an account, with, with a bank, is actually um, entering into or, 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 or amending a contract you have with the bank that says it, the bank now owes Richard this amount of money and under the following circumstances, Richard can ask for it back. So actually this idea of, of, of modeling, um, modeling financial relationships as, as contract, it actually turns out to be quite um, general and, and generalizable. And it then allows you to ask a question, which is, well, who are the parties to this contract? Who needs to know about it? Who needs to observe it? Who needs to verify it? And under what circumstances might other people downstream need to verify it as well? So very quickly, you can then begin to ask questions, just as I've said, about what is the data that needs to be captured? What's the overarching legal agreement that governs it? What are the rules that govern its evolution? Who needs to, who needs to sign any transitions? Who needs to be told about them? Um, and, and perhaps importantly, how do we ensure that you know, two proposed transitions to, to, to something representing a contract are not in conflict? Um, that leads quite naturally, I would argue, to, to our selection of the UTXO model, because the UTXO model, just as in Bitcoin, is, is you know, the, the transactions in that, in, that, um, in that system, they're very, very explicit. They say, you know, these are the current pieces of information in the system, the current contracts, if you like, in our model. I, I assert they're current. I assert they are, they, are, they are pertinent to me. Here is how I'd like to change them, replace them with these new contracts. Here's the proof I'm entitled to. Um, and there's a self-contained unit that can be verified independently and in parallel with all the others because it's completely, completely um, explicit about which parts of the data set it's updating in a way that's much, much harder to do in a general purpose virtual machine. Um, so that's, that's, that's how we thought about it from a business context. But of course, everything I'm saying here, you could argue, is actually just a set of requirements. How it's actually implemented is, of course, a different story. And I guess I'll, I'll, I guess I'll let, let Mike pick it up. So I'm going to assume uh, the listener is familiar with how Bitcoin works. I don't know if that's a valid assumption, but it'll save a bit of time. So in Bitcoin, every row in the database is a quantity of Bitcoin and then a little program that determines who can access it, right? The script and the value. Um, in Corda, uh, we want to store more stuff than just a quantity of cash, right? A quantity of a single currency. So this is, we, we, I think Richard has talked a bit about states already. A state is um, a, currently in the current design, it's actually an arbitrary collection of objects. It's an object graph. We may restrict that a little bit um, in future, but one of, the, one of the things we've been doing this year is a lot of experimentation and prototyping and proof of concepts with Corda to see how much power developers really need and where we can restrict them a little bit to get other features and where we, where we can't. So currently a state is a, a full-blown serialized object graph. And if you want to represent something like cash um, in, a, in a quarter transaction, all, all, uh, quarter is like Bitcoin in that all entries in the database come from transactions and you can refer to them with a hash of a transaction and then an output index. And to do something like representing cash, the state would not only include the number of pennies, right, the, the sort of equivalent of Satoshi's for fiat money, but also um, the issuer, right, because um, dollars issued by Barclays are not the same thing as dollars issued by a central bank. Well, I should say pounds issued by Barclays are not the same thing as pounds issued by a central bank, right? There's, like, you're exposed to default risk and so on. They're not quite the same thing. And then there's a few other, you know, things that, uh, that you have to track as part of even something quite basic like cash. So quarter has a, it can represent currencies, but it can also represent other things like, uh, like we've mentioned the contents of deals and interest rate swap, all this stuff. They're all still putting the outputs where a Bitcoin transaction would have only a value. We mentioned a little bit at the start, right? We're using Ethereum developed its own virtual machine for this. So did Bitcoin for the task of expressing the, the logic behind new transaction types. Um, we chose to modify the JVM to do that because, again, this is coming back to, you know, we're designing this for banking and business. 
Um, virtual machines are a well understood technology, right? This is not a new area of computer science by any, any means. Um, there are high quality, robust, industrial strength virtual machines out there. The most successful is a JVM in banking. Java and J JVM bytecode is everywhere. A lot of banks are now using things like Scala as well. You can compile Haskell to the JVM. You can a lot of languages which crop up repeatedly in finance. You can you run on this platform. You've got tools. You've got IDEs. It doesn't make sense to us to reinvent all this stuff. So part of the the work we've been doing with Corda is allowing you to define new transaction types by defining new smart contracts. In you don't have to use Java. And in fact, Corda itself is written in a language called Kotlin, which is very new. Um, it's but it, it's compatible with Java. So we've we've done a bunch of things there. Another thing which is very different and will strike people immediately when they look at, when they compare Corda with Bitcoin is that in Bitcoin and Ethereum, when you create a new transaction, you sort of pick some random peers on the network and you send it to them and they, they pick some more and they propagate it around, right? And the network sort of gossips new transactions until everybody has seen them. And nodes on the network don't have any real identity and they don't have any real obligations. Effectively, these systems attempt to build a reliable component out of unreliable parts. And such a thing is always statistical, right? You can't always reason about how reliable the Bitcoin network is because the people making it up can disappear at will. They can arbitrarily sort of deviate from the protocol and who even knows who's doing it. This is how Bitcoin ended up with miners that won't make big blocks. In Corda, it's structured more like the email network. So every node is identified. Um, every connection between them is uh, secured with TLS and, um, and certificates that we issue, right? If, if well, whoever runs a quarter network is issuing it, it doesn't have to be us, right? You can run your own quarter networks, of course, if you want with different rules. And then nodes only communicate with each other when they actually have a specific reason to, and there's no global broadcast. So if I want to send cash to you, then I connect to your node and I give you a cash transaction. And then you say, oh, I don't know the dependencies of this, so I can't verify. Give me the dependencies and I give you all the dependencies. And then now you have all of the dependencies of that transaction, you have the entire graph. And then next time you send it onwards, you send, you know, you tack your own transaction that moves the cash or spends the cash on the end. And then you send the whole graph onwards to the next guy in the chain. So the data propagates around the network lazily. You, you see only data that you need to in order to verify the parts of the ledger that are interesting to you. And this has a whole bunch of interesting uh, consequences like you can actually in theory you can run two separate quarter networks that are totally independent and then merge them together later right um both sides need to agree to trust each other's notaries and we can talk about notaries a bit if you like but basically once you've established connectivity between them and if they trust each other's identities and um, notaries then you can actually do that merge and it all just works because there was never any assumption that all data was visible to begin with you can't do that with blockchain based systems and again this is one of those requirements that sort of comes out of talking to people who work at banks and they say, well, you know, gee, we would like to start with an internal deployment maybe and then, you know, join the rest of the world a bit later after we're comfortable with the technology. There's always going to be political concerns. Maybe some countries want to have their own separate network for political reasons if they're in a fight with the West right now and maybe later it's resolved and you want to bring everyone back together. There's all kinds of reasons why it's useful to be able to do that. Today's magic word is Accord. That's A C C O R D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in into the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward. I would prefer that we try to break down this excellent explanation like through an example, right? So so one of the examples that uh, that Richard came up with is the example of the interest rate swap. Yeah. So let's try to just talk about what an interest rate swap is and then like fit it into this Corda model. How would, how would it work there? And then we'll keep on adding parties. So we might start with the basic interest rate swap. So let's say it's Brian and I, and we are two different financial institutions. And what we want to do is an interest rate swap. So we are going to take, I don't know, a standard uh, interest rate index, maybe from, I'm, I'm not even sure, maybe the Fed funds rate or something. So there's the standard interest rate index that keeps moving every day. And Brian and I kind of want to have a contract that let's say the interest rate is 2% today. And if it goes to 3%, for every percentage rise in, in interest rate, uh, I don't know, Brian pays me like $10 million. And every percent fall in the interest rate, I pay Brian 
the same 10 million dollars let's say it's, it's something very similar simple like that so interest rate moves depending on how much it moves either i pay to brian or brian pays to me right so now uh so that's a contract now brian and i want to do this contract and this contract fundamentally requires me to trust brian to fulfill my obligations if something is due to me and brian to trust uh, uh myself right yeah and and maybe we are going to settle every three months so so we're going to do the contract right now and then three months later we're going to see what the interest rate is on that current day and then whether if it's higher or lower than two percent we will calculate who needs to pay who how much and then we'll exchange that amounts three months later we'll do the same thing again etc right so how would this kind of transaction between two financial institutions be modeled as a corda object or a corda contract well, you know, at the end of once we've released it as open source, I can just point people to the code because it <laughs> the code base that contains um, it actually contains two different um, what we call core DApps uh, that implement uh, interest rate swaps. Um, they will probably merge them at some point. They they do different things related to interest rate swaps. Um, but basically, yeah, you start by defining a state um, to represent that deal, and, and because a state is just a bag of objects, you know, you can represent this in a bunch of ways. Um, the quarter spec incorporates parts of the um, the Java spec into itself because that's a very well specified platform. Right? There's detailed documents on how it works, so you can do things like record timestamps, um, you know, using the standard library types and things like that. You can define fixing schedules and so on. Once I've put together a transaction with no inputs and one output, so this is like a Genesis transaction, but there's no there's no blockchain, right? It just exists, sort of floating in space. Um, I give it a unique deal ID or whatever to make sure that the hash of this transaction is unique. Then we then we start what um, Corda calls um, flow, right? So in a system where there's no global broadcast and commun all communications take place between like specific nodes, you need uh, and also the protocols involved can be very complicated. You need some way to manage that. You see these little like node to node protocols crop up in other systems too, like right? Bitcoin has like the payment protocol, BIP70, it has um, micropayment channels or just payment channels where two nodes are sort of interacting outside of the blockchain or outside of the standard network to, to come to some sort of deal or some sort of agreement between themselves. And, and that kind of thing is the exception to the norm in Bitcoin and Ethereum, but in Corda, that is the norm. That's how all, all communication takes place. So I would create such a transaction there's a component in a network called the network map, which is basically a map of identities to nodes and, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, someone would type in, oh, I want to do an interest rate swap with, um, you know, with Brian, right? And then press enter and off it goes, it finds Brian's node, starts a flow with them, proposes that transaction. The other side says, yeah, looks good. Sends me back the digital signature, right? So at this point now we have a sort of mutually signed transaction and we both agree on the hash of this transaction. So the details are agreed at the byte level. This is very simple, of course. Then we want to start evolving that deal, right? As it changes, every time we want to fix a new, we want to refix it to an, uh, a new um, interest rate. For example, there might be an Oracle in the network that knows interest rates. So we can then embed the new interest rate into a transaction. Quarter transactions have inputs and outputs, just like Bitcoin. They also have um, commands, which is a sort of because you can because in Bitcoin there's only like two kinds of transaction, right? There's one to move money and there's one to create money, and you know it's a creation, you know it's a genesis transaction because of the position in the blockchain. Quarter transactions can do many different things, so you need a way to sometimes distinguish what it's doing, and that's what commands are for. So you create another transaction that has a you know fix the interest rate command in it. You would send, then you would start another flow. The flow would send it to an Oracle. The Oracle would sign because it sees it's valid. You get that back. You send it to the other side. The other side verifies it, says, yes, I'm signing too, sends it back. And there's a multi-step procedure here where you're moving signatures and transactions and data around. Then we want to introduce notaries, perhaps, which are how um, a notary defines, you know, basically a notary is the part that stops double spending. And uh, whereas in, um, you know, in the systems that most people are familiar with, uh, the consensus mechanism is bound very tightly with the definition of the network. Bitcoin has one blockchain and that sort of defines Bitcoin and Ethereum, same thing. Um, a quarter network can have multiple different competing notaries, actually, uh, and different transactions can be deconflicted, like double spend deconflicted by different services. Um, 
So you can then start involving one of those. So that's another step. Maybe there's a step where you report to a regulator. That's another step. These protocols can become very complicated. And so one of the things Corda provides is what we call the flow framework, which allows you to write these protocols in very straightforward code. It looks, um, it looks like the simplest possible code you can write, I would say. Um, basically, the flow framework gives you what appears to the programmer to be kind of unkillable Uber threads, which can survive for days or weeks, they can survive process restarts, they can even survive upgrades of your node in some cases. So you write your interactions like send message here, get a message back, send message there, get a message back. Um, and then by the end, you have agreement on what's going on and that is then committed to your node's vault, we call it. Bitcoin and Ethereum have wallets and that's a little bit folksy for banks. They, they want something a bit more robust sounding. So we have the vault. And then one of the things quarter states can define is a relational mapping. So once uh, no, once once these transactions have been processed, um, they get converted into relational database tables, inserted into a relational database. And you can then join those tables with your own internal apps state, right? So you can have information which is both on the global ledger and in-house, like your customer database or whatever. And then you can just join that data together in the normal relational way using join keys and select statements in SQL and so on. Okay, so that's that, that seems really cool. So the way the way I, I tend to think of this is um, that you're, you're, you're essentially taking all of these contracts, like so a contract between me and Brian, which might be an interest rate swap or some other kind of contract, representing this as a digital object. And then uh, every time, uh, we, we, we create this digital object and then we do transactions to modify the current state of this digital object. So this kind of keeps moving. Every time we do a transaction, we ensure that if me and Brian are the parties to it, then there's my signature on it and Brian's signature on it and maybe a notary signature on it to make sure that some rules of the transactions are also being followed, right? So all of these signatures keep on accumulating and that tells me what the current uh, state of my contract with Brian is. And now I, I could have contracts with many parties like with Brian, with Richard, with yourself, and I could collect all of these objects, so collect all of these contracts together in one relational database. And that kind of shows me what my firm as a whole is doing in, in the market, what contracts I'm participating in in the market. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I would clarify one thing, which is you don't always need a signature from every involved party, right? The set of signatures that you need for any given um, type of transaction is defined by the smart contract code itself. You don't want to be in a situation where your, part, your counterparty is defaulted and you know the, the courts have moved in and seized all of their computers and the, the electricity company cut them off because they didn't pay their bills and now you can't update the database to reflect they're in default because they, they're not signing. Um, you can, you know, in some cases, you can advance these agreements without all parties being involved. It, it depends on how the smart contract code is written. And, and it's, it's, it's worth it's worth probably adding something else there. There's a good, um, even in the non-default case, there's, I guess there are good game theoretic reasons why we need this as well. One, one of the, um, and we talked about you know, the requirements and, and what problems we were trying to solve. One of the motivating examples we used um, in, in the early design work was that of a just a traditional um, option agreement, put option, a call option. Um, if you might model that as an agreement, you know, maybe I have the right to, um, I, have, I, have, I have the right but not the obligation to, um, to demand that I can buy a security from you. Um, they have deadlines, they, they expire at a certain time. Um, if it were just before the expiry um, and I wanted to exercise it and I required your signature as well for it to be valid, well, you might have just the slightest incentive to, to run a bit slow and, um, and, and allow the clock to tick past, um, past midnight. Um, so, so that would be, I guess, you know, a perfect sort of like business as usual example of where only the exercise or and then the notary to um, to commit to the timestamp um, is required to sign it. It's also, when I guess we may not get into this detail, it's also why the the notary, as as in you know, the the cluster that that provides confirmation of of no conflict, is also the entity that commits to the time. Those two things can't be separated. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO, Nico Labaca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button, so that you can verify everything that is done on the device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. 
Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from STMicro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest level that lets you protect applications from each other, which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, and we will also provide a FIDO authenticator and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. <laughs> So just if, if you briefly kind of bridge the gap here to, to the blockchain idea, right? Because in a way, what you do in blockchain is that you say you have these transactions and, and they all, uh, you know, you put them together and you timestamp them. So you know the exact order and, and then there's this global agreement on the order. Whereas here, I think you are, you're still having the same idea that you have kind of transactions or events that are between parties and they're sort of, you know, hung... Uh, cryptographically uh, on top of each other or sort of chained to each other so that one can follow the whole history, verify everything. But then you say, there's no need to have this global agreement. There, there may be a need to have some agreements at some point. And, and it's quite obvious also, if you look at this, uh, who's, who's supposed to agree on something? How much security is needed? You know, does it need a regulator? Or is it just between the two parties? Is, is there a need for third parties to be able to verify that like all of those things will depend a lot on the circumstances so it's almost like that's it's not part of the fundamental thing it's just something you layer on top through the notary stand and you have uh, enormous flexibility there and saying well it, it's just going to be however the business requirements uh, want it to be yeah yeah the, the key thing to realize is if you don't have a blockchain um you don't have a total ordering of all transactions relative to each other, but you don't actually need that, right? You only need um, an ordering um, when there is a double spend to resolve. And uh, quarter transactions don't define a precise time at which they occur. They define um, time windows, which may be open-ended, right? So you can express things like Bitcoin's end lock time um, with a quarter transaction, but you can also say this transaction must occur within this window of time. It can't be a specific time because of you know, there's no global clock, right? You can define the sort of a time window and then, you know, take, make it wide enough to take into account the speed of light and so on. But, you, but there's never any point where you can say precisely which transaction came first, unless there's a double spend where you don't need to. So why bother, why bother providing that expensive guarantee? And, uh, and in this example of the time window, so is that where Richard Point comes in that because I can, of course, make up whatever time locally, and if it's not put in a blockchain, uh, nobody can verify it. So that's where you need kind of a notary or a third party to to provide the time. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So often, often you need you need some notion of a time for reporting reasons and and to you know interact with the logic like the, the put option example. You know, we specify that notary, the machines in a notary cluster are supposed to be synchronized to the U.S. Naval Observatory time, right, which you can get from a GPS feed. Um, there's a mapping of that. That time scale doesn't always, that doesn't, like the raw time scale doesn't include leap seconds. And there's, the, you know, the, there's some stuff in the specification and, and the design documents about handling that and so on. But ultimately, you know, you don't know what the exact time the notaries will observe is. So you can only ever specify it in a fuzzy timestamp in a way, yeah. It's maybe worth just saying some, just one other thing on the notaries, because I know when we um, sometimes when I, when I explain this to people in other contexts, um, it, it, that there are often a lot of questions, and I imagine your, 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 your viewers and listeners may have a few as well. So, um, um, so anticipating some of them, I'll, I'll just give a little bit more color on that. 
So, so we use the word um, we use the word notary, um, albeit we may have to um, we, we may have to be um, we may we may have to change that if um, if it turns out it's incompatible with um, with some European um, re some re European um, um, regions. Um, but we use it because we want to evoke the idea of it's the thing in the architecture that is providing that stamp. For safety's sake, we think the notary should validate transactions, but but they don't strictly need to. The the the, the function they're performing is to say yes. I saw this transaction and it doesn't conflict with, i.e. it does not spend any of the same inputs as something I've previously signed. So it's providing that the same guarantee you get from a blockchain that says, you know, if a transaction makes it successfully into the blockchain, um, it has, you know, it has outcompeted any others that try to spend the same inputs and you know which one got confirmed. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that, that, that's a logical concept when, as described. Concretely, um, there are many different ways of implementing a notary. You could imagine a centralized service. Um, clearly, that, that, that may work in some situations, is, is suboptimal in others. You can imagine a, um, a high performance cluster that isn't Byzantine fault tolerant, and you can imagine a, a Byzantine fault tolerant um, cluster that implements a notary. Um, but then, as Mike says, we can have many notaries, many notary clusters implementing different algorithms with different qualities of service um, um, in different geographies um, with, 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 with different characteristics, all on the same network. And the thing that ties it all together is when a transaction is created and signed, the outputs each commit to the notary that is authoritative for whether that output has been spent. So when you look at any given transaction, um, you know whether the output of that transaction has been spent because it commits to the notary at the time it's created. And we can have many different notaries. Why might we want this? There could be ge geographic and performance reasons. If all you're trading for a particular particular set of um, set of trades is all with people in the same region, then having a geographically close notary for performance might be something you need. Um, there may be regulatory reasons where um, um, a regulator insists that any, any transactions involving money issued by their banks is notarized on their shores. Um, and there are also arguments for how this kind of technology gets adopted incrementally, where um, before we get to a fully decentralized model, there are steps along the way that are a part of the way there and get us there incrementally. So, so, um, so this idea of you know, multiple, multiple notaries, multiple consensus services on one network um, is, um, is is surprisingly powerful and and, um, and and useful in multiple domains. Yeah, to make that concrete, we have a prototype of a raft-based notary cluster. At the moment, um, that might be appropriate, you know, for City of London, you know, interbank trading where they they're not going to maliciously double spend each other, right? They just need a just need a mechanism to make sure there are no accidents. And then we'll probably um, we're, we're looking at using the PBFT smart algorithm um, and implementation for a, like a global a global notary that may include you know parties that sort of don't uh, don't trust each other so much. So uh, w one question I had is um, one of the hard parts about um, putting blockchain like systems or shared ledger systems inside uh, inside a financial institution context is. Um, they almost always have to interact with some other legacy system, right? So I might be a financial institution, Brian might be a financial institution, and we might have an interest rate swap, but now the payment actually needs to go through, let's say the real time gross settlement system of say the United States, right? And now the issue here is that the money flows on that other system, but that other system is not cryptographic. It doesn't have a cryptographic proof that some event happened in that other system. So we might have uh, this contract object and our contract objects, the state must need to be updated to reflect the fact that I have made a payment to Brian, but I don't ha I may not necessarily have a cryptographic proof that this payment was made. So how does Corda handle something like that? Yeah, I'm actually kind of glad you asked about this because this is a, one of those really boring topics that no one ever thinks about when designing the systems, but you can't deploy um, if you don't think about it. Right. So obviously, the ideal scenario, uh, the ideal scenario, is everything is on the ledger, including cash. And then, you know, for an interest rate swap transaction, you can actually update the deal and move the cash atomically in the same transaction. Everything is nice, and it's all on one system, and so on. If it isn't, um, then you need to uh, basically, you know, but both sides. And it's not just like um, interaction with real-time gross settlement systems, right? Banks, well, or any financial institution have all kinds of internal reporting systems, and you know, they they want to print out reports at the end of the day, maybe all kinds of stuff that's specific to that organization that needs to interact with the global ledger. So this flow framework I mentioned earlier, this thing that gives you these kind of Uber threads, the quarter platform. So a core app 
is a thing shared between um, institutions. It defines the smart contracts where this determinism is very, very important and that code is precisely shared. It also defines these flows. But the, because these flows are just protocols um, that are implemented by both sides, they don't have to be exactly the same on either side, right? They're not a part of the consensus mechanism. And so the idea is that these, these flows can be subclassed, right? They're just ordinary sort of Java classes. You can customize them in various ways. You can say, okay, at this point in the process of updating an interest rate swap or doing whatever it is you're doing, um, I'm going to run some custom code and I'm going to call out to some internal system, right? Quarter nodes are um, at heart, they, they, they're built on um, a sort of industrial strength message queuing system. We're using something called Ar Artemis, but we'll probably make it pluggable later. Um, message queues are very common inside banks. You know, you have messages going here and there and they can be saved to disk and or into databases and they can time out and they can be monitored and all these kind of things. So what you would do is, you know, you would customize your flow and say, okay, well, at this point, I want to make a payment. I'm going to override that method. Instead of trying to find cash in my vault, right, in my wallet to make this payment, I cast it to the message queue to some other system that will then go off and talk via Swift to, uh, you know, the RTGS or do whatever it needs to do. On the other side, you know, the other side is also subclustered at the point in the flow where it's waiting for payment then again, it's interacting through these sort of message queues or by making HTTP requests to um, their internal systems. So the, the nodes know how to interact with existing legacy systems. They don't need cryptographic proof. They just wait at that point in the protocol before they sign the next transaction on the global ledger. They just wait until the internal system flags it up and says, oh, hey, you know, it's, it's good. We're good to proceed. Um, flows. Um, the current code doesn't support this, but it's a part of the design we're heading towards implementing. The idea is a flow can also interact with a human being this way. So you don't only interact with nodes on the peer-to-peer -peer network and you know internal systems. You can also send messages to people, and that's useful for saying things like, this looks weird, should I sign it? Or even, you need to sign this transaction with keys you have in a little Trezor-type device. Um, you know, the, the node itself doesn't have the keys needed to do that. So this is why we have these sort of long-lived threads, right? That you can survive for days or weeks because maybe the person's on vacation or sick that day. So you need the ability to like pause the execution at that point until they come back, do their thing, and then resume with that signature you've obtained from the person. Cool. Yeah, I think that integration is going to be very important. Now, one of the things that's uh, important to cover on the technical side that we haven't yet talked about. So th you mentioned that uh, Corda uses the, the Java virtual machine. Now, the, the most well-known virtual machine, of course, in the blockchain space is the Ethereum virtual machine. And a, a big reason of uh, thinking behind it is that they said, OK, it needs to be deterministic. So on every node, it needs the you know, same input, it to be exactly the same output. Uh, and that's why you know they developed a new programming language and and did everything sort of from scratch and differently. Now the Java Java isn't uh, deterministic, right? And the Java virtual machine isn't deterministic. So how how do you handle that? How is that? Uh, does that mean only a subset of Java can be used, or how do you address this problem? Yeah, it's only a subset of Java can be used. There's a there's a whole list of things that you need to do to convert a JVM to being this completely deterministic thing, but. If you just compare, you know, the EVM and JVM or Solidity and, and Java, they are very, very similar, right? They have a lot more in common than they don't have. Um, and so, yeah, requiring people to learn these new languages, which often um, the EVM is, is, I would say, kind of quirky in many ways. Uh, the basic data width um, in the EVM is 256 bits, which leads to some very puzzling and, and strange sort of data usage uh, scenarios and things like that. Like a, you can define a byte array in two ways, and one way is, a, is an actual byte array, and another one isn't. You know, going with something like the JVM avoids a lot of those issues. As some examples of things you have to fix. Um, so uh, you obviously have to restrict access to things like file IO, network IO, um, random number generators. Random number generators are lurking in a few places you have to be careful of, like uh, Every Java object has a thing called a hash code, which is very useful because it means you can put any object into hash maps, hash sets. This is functionality that programmers just love and use all the time. Hash codes are, um, if you don't specify how one is calculated for a class, then it defaults to being a random number generator. So that has to be patched. Um, you need the ability to terminate execution, right? So you need a kind of similar concept to gas. That can be done with, um, we're, we're doing this with a bytecode rewriting phase. 
Um, and there's a, a bunch of other things, but yeah, the, the basic strategy is you define a subset of the, uh, the platform. You forbid features, right? You, you take away features that are incompatible with um, determinism. And what you've got left is something that's still pretty complete and still pretty useful. and has a lot of functionality that Ethereum uh, developers want but don't have, but you've done it for a fraction of the work, right? It's much easier to carefully review what's there and then adapt it than to build everything from scratch. And it's, it's worth adding one other thing to that as well, which is this intersects quite nicely with the decision to which is with the decision to use the UTXO model rather than the, the, the virtual machine model, because um, that restricted um, subset of Java that, or the, the JVM bytecode set that, um, that, that Mike, um, Mike describes, that is, that, is, that, is, that is what we need for the, the consensus layer, so the bit that has to run the same on every node. But that's pretty much only transaction verification. So if I send you a transaction that purports to do something, we need to know that when I verify it and when you verify it and anybody else who needs to verify it verifies it, we all agree it was valid or we all agree it was invalid. All the extra work that you have to write when thinking about smart contracts, how you generate transactions, how you chose what the transaction would do, how you figured out you know, which order to include things in it. That's something that's just run once in quarter and is run by the generating node. So, um, and that you can do however you like. You're not subject to those restrictions. Um, whereas in the, you know, the full virtual machine model types, um, typically you write a lot more code in your smart contract and that's all stuff that has to be running, all stuff that runs in the consensus layer and everyone has to agree on. So that, that the separation means even that quite, quite rich subset we allow that restriction is only there for the code use for the, for, the, for the specific cases where you need to verify a transaction, not where you're crazy. There's a whole bunch of advantages to doing it this way. You know, one, one obvious one is that um, you don't. Not every case where you're working with transactions has to be sandboxed and deterministic. If you want to make a, a nice GUI that draws transactions on the screen, for example, doesn't you know? <laughs> if you if you've whitelisted the transaction types that you're using, you don't have to worry about uh, determinism or security, right? You just want to access the data that's inside and run them and see if they're valid. And um, you know, maybe if it's not completely deterministic, it doesn't matter. So it's it, it's super convenient to just be able to drop this code in as if it was a regular library and start working with it. Yeah, for generating transactions as well, you you know that they're valid because you're constructing them. So you don't really want any pain from crossing language barriers and things. You just want to just want to start instantiating objects and working with it. Okay, the, the, the design of Corda looks looks really interesting. It's probably the most fascinating tech, like technical design that I've, I've seen uh, around this space. But for the final section, let's kind of uh, jump into sort of the, the business proposition with uh, for a platform like Corda. So the way I see it is like what Corda could enable in the future once it's uh, running at a large scale is for a large financial institution, an investment bank, it can allow them to have one unified view of all of the contracts that they are participating in and uh, ha have it like uh, have it like in, in, in one system, right? And when a lot of these institutions have these uh, shared shared global views of all the contracts that they are participating in, it solves the problem of them need to uh, sp spend time on reconciliation or making sure there are no errors, etc. So how, how does a system like this impact the economics of financial services firms? And does it, does it benefit small firms? Does it benefit large firms? How, what is the economic impact of removing the reconciliation process? Okay, so I'll, I'll give um, maybe, um, maybe answer that through, through, um, through a few examples, but start with... Um, Re, I guess restating the, the 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 essence of the problem space. So you use the word reconciliation, and um, so, so let, let, let's let's just be clear about what we mean by that. Um, so the uh, you gave an interest rate swap example earlier. So it is not atypical. It is it is common in the case where we've negotiated a deal like that between ourselves bilaterally. We've and we've and we're we're managing it through its life cycle bilaterally. We're not using a, a central counterparty, a clearinghouse. Um, then each of us will have built at least one system each, often many, where that deal is recorded and where aspects of its life cycle are managed. Um, so, um, so to, to say we each have two would, be, would be, be an understatement. So that's four systems between us, all of which are recording the same data, all of which have to agree on a large subset of their functionality. 
Um, but they're written by different people with slightly different functional requirement sets, slightly different assumptions, slightly different reference data, slightly different bugs. Um, and so they mostly agree, but, but sometimes they don't. So we have to we have to put both in a um, a, a prevent and a and a response strategy. So there are lots of reconciliation processes that go on that affirmatively check throughout the life cycle of that of that trade that both sides have indeed reached the same conclusions as to you know what the current status of the deal is, who owes what to whom, um, what needs to happen next. So that's expensive. Um, it poses it, it imposes what amounts to a you know, sort of almost an IT tax on organisations. They they have to spend this money in order to be able to participate in that market. Um, and it's um, and, and that, that cost is obviously um, it reduces the number of firms who can participate, but it also is is is, is experienced as, as higher costs by customers. If we can move to a model where that deal is is recorded um, recorded accurately once, and each of our systems is participating in this network. So that when I look at my copy of the deal, I know that what I see is what you see. We both know that we see the same thing because we're running on this consensus layer. Then we get massive benefits from sharing the, 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 the consensus code only needs to be written once. We probably will still need to run some reconciliations until we get confident, but we won't need to run as many and they'll identify fewer breaks as we go. So the, both the, you know, the, the day-to-day costs go down but also the, you know, the, the fixed ongoing costs of running this infrastructure should go down as well, which I would, I, I would argue, although I've not done the analysis on this, would, um, would allow for, for more players and hence more, 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 more competition and, um, and, and more creativity and innovation. So, so that's just, um, that's just um, one example. The other example, and this is a project we did with some members um, late in the summer, um, early, in, early in the fall, was to look at a very, um, a very specific, um, specific, specific regulation I mean, this project's not public, so I'll just talk about this one in, in generalities. But a specific regulation that says, in effect, that if two banks, if two institutions cannot come to agreement on who owes what to whom across a portfolio of trades accurately and within a certain time period, if they cannot do that, then they, they, um, they have to hold more, more capital, uh, which therefore means it's more expensive for them to be in business, their, their profitability will be, will be suppressed. So, so, so quite apart from the IT cost of running this infrastructure, there are, there are regulatory reasons that directly affect the balance sheet if banks can't show that they are indeed in consensus and running similar or identical business logic with their peers. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I, I don't want to, to overstate or oversell this because change takes time. Um, you know, implementing change and implementing you know, new and better systems in one organization is difficult. Doing it across multiple institutions at the same time is, of course, harder still. So, um, so we should expect this to be you know, an incremental journey that we're on, but the but the prize is big and real. So, Richard, if if you can uh, for a moment put on your your speculative hat and be completely responsible and think about what what will that mean for the financial system? Like, what what, what is it going to look like ten years or fifteen years from now? Once a lot of this change is percolated through the organizations and and changed sort of the structure of banks and other financial institutions? I'm not going to rise to the bait. I, 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 I don't know the answer to that, but, but I do think I know one thing, which is um, a lot, not, not all, and, and I'm not here as, a, as, as an apologist for, for some of the excesses, but a lot, of, a lot of the complex instruments that exist, exist to solve a real client need. You know, we talked about those interest rate swaps. You know, at the end of that chain of transactions, there's almost always company trying to, to hedge its interest rate risk or trying to ensure that it's protected against, you know, um, against exchange rate fluctuations for, um, for some goods it's buying or for some, for some goods it's selling. There are people in the real economy at the end of this chain. And the, because of the, the, the problems we've had in the past, there is a strong regulatory move towards ever more standardization of these instruments, the moving of them towards central clearinghouses so that, um, so that the regulators get far more confidence that, that there won't be any, any blow-ups. Um, to the extent that this technology, and I think it will, to the extent that this technology allows that, that regulatory direction of travel to continue, but we still get the customization and the, um, the specialization we need to actually solve the problems of the people who are buying these products, to the extent we can do that, um, it will be a, be a benefit to all. Um, so I, I can't predict what the financial system will look like in, in two years, let alone 10 years. Um, but any technology that, that drives sort of safety and consistency through knowing that there are there are no mismatched trades, no no incorrect views of the world, while still while still allowing the banks to serve what is ultimately their customers, um, is is um, is is what I'm focused on. I'll rise to the bait. 
it'll be easier to be your own bank. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great point, right? Because in the end, you you would imagine that first of all, the the cost of of running all these systems is going to dram be dramatically lower, and then there's probably going to be much more standardization across the systems. Uh, so yeah, you no, know, maybe you won't, you can finally be your own bank, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it'll ever happen because there's lots and lots of people in these institutions who can say no. But it would be, I think, it'd be fun to get to a point where you know your online bank has like a internet ATM and you can withdraw like digital pounds and you know use them as if they were like you would have used bitcoins. And there would be withdrawal limits and so on, just like with a real ATM because of security and other reasons. But um, it would be a nice thing to be able to get to the point where. You can send money around just like you could with Bitcoin, but you're using, you know, more useful currencies. We've talked a lot about, you know, making the existing financial system more efficient, you know, replicating an interest rate swap. Are there entirely new products and, you know, use cases that today don't exist that will become possible once this technology or technologies like this have become widely adopted? Well, there's there's a lot of discussion around using this sort of thing for supply chain management and things like that. Um, currently, uh, and and all, especially around management of trade, like international shipping and things like this, which is currently an incredibly paper based process. I don't know if you would call them like new products, but uh, the um, the act of selling things around the world is is remarkably bureaucratic outside of you know internet services and so on. Um, making it easier to sell things, making it easier to figure out where things have come from. If you look at some of the things going on in the world around trade deals and so on, right, the traditional approach to tackling all this bureaucracy and paperwork has been building political unions and political blocks, and that's starting to run out of steam. So maybe if instead of tackling the the, the bureaucracy and, and problems of, of these things with uh, political unions, you just have really, really, really efficient software and really efficient tracking and things like that, then that's another way of you know, making trade easier and tackling these problems. Well, I don't know, maybe. And maybe I'll add to that. I guess Mike gave a um, pretty exciting um, example in a be your own ATM. That sounds like a new product to me. It's not something that we are we're in the process of building, but it, you, you can see how this technology could, could, could get you there if, 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 someone, if, if someone followed that train of thought. The other thing, and maybe this, um, maybe this is going a step further, is to think about um, what happens when you have a, a network of quarter notes um, upon which multiple applications, multiple cord apps, as, as we call them, are deployed. Um, the, the, in, the interaction and interoperability of those applications, I think, is also a, um, a source of, of a potential future innovation. I don't pretend to have the imagination to say how that would be used. Um, but having um, having applications that can, within the bounds of the consensus layer and the verification logic, manipulate the the state objects of of other applications, build upon them, um, and, and reuse their functionality. I don't think we've even begun to, as an industry to think about where that might take us. Okay, so we're almost at the end, but there's one thing we do want to address very briefly. So Corda, of course, is open source, available for anybody. Anybody can do anything with it. It also doesn't have uh, you know, a built-in token or something like that to monetize it. So there's a different project that you guys are working on called Concord. Can you share anything about what Concord is, how it's different from Corda, and, and maybe how that relates to the R3 business model? Yeah, sure. So, so exactly as you said, um, Corda is the sof is 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 the software that, that our team has been building. It will be open sourced um, under the Apache Two license on November thirtieth. It's our it's our it's our it's our hope to contribute that to the to the Hyperledger project. Uh, but as you say, that that software, you know, um, software unless it's deployed and, and solving real business problems is an interesting curiosity. But it's um you know, it, it's not particularly useful. It, it's just interesting. So the um, so the the other piece of work, and we and we've spoken a little about this in, in in public, is 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 essentially driven by the thought experiment that says, right, okay, that's great. We've identified these problems that um, need to be solved, and for which um, Corda is 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 a foundation of the solution. Um, but this almost back to the founding principles of of R three. Um, this is useful when it's solving real problems for, in our case, our, our case, um, you know, banks and, and financial institutions. This software needs to be deployed um, across them. They need to have these have nodes. They need to be secured. They need to be connected to each other. The messages need to be routed. 
Um, and just as I hinted earlier, um, this becomes more valuable to, 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 to institutions and their clients and, and, and to everybody when, when you don't have to deploy a different network for every application. You want a you know, common, shared, inclusive network that, that people, not just us, other people can come along and, and deploy applications on, on top of. Um, and that, that, in a nutshell, is, is Project Concord. It's the, the vision for how we take um, you know, Corda, open source software, and, and deploy it as a network upon which other people can then build applications. So we get the benefits from, from sharing that infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the idea. OK, well, I, I think we're at the end. We've been running quite a long time, but this is a very exciting project. And it will be very exciting to see what happens when it comes out uh, just, just a few weeks from now, um, depending when we release this. And I'm sure it's also something we'll, we'll come back to, right? So um, I think it's our expectation and probably and certainly your expectation that, that this will become widely used. Probably lots of people will build applications on top of it, will uh, build technology around it. And uh, it will be exciting to see what impact this is going to have on, on the financial system. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so thanks thank so much for joining. Indeed. Thank yeah. you for having us. And of course, we're going to have links to, to the white paper, to, uh, to some of the other resources that are out there. And, and the Mike's technical white paper is also going to come out in a few weeks. So probably not at the time this comes out, but we will certainly also tweet, tweet it out uh, and, and, and share that. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much for our listeners as well for uh, joining us once again. So Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and many others on letstalkbitcoin.com. And of course, you can subscribe to this uh, podcast in any podcast application or uh, watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenter. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Bye.